Hey, welcome back. In this episode, we're going to look into checklist for creating an Azure virtual machine. My name is Sushant Sutish and I'm your trainer for this AZ303 certification course. Without wasting any more time, let's get into it. So for performing a migration of on-premises servers to Azure requires planning and care. You can move them all at once or more likely in small batches or even individually. Before you create a single virtual machine, you should sit down and sketch out your current infrastructure model and see how it might map to the cloud. So these are the fundamental checklist of things to consider as you work through creating a virtual machine in Azure. The first step is starting with the network. When you set up a virtual network, you specify the available address space, subnet, and security. If the VNet would be connected to other VNet, you must select address ranges that are not overlapping. So after deciding the virtual network address space, you can create one or more subnets for your virtual network. You do this to break up the network into more manageable sections. For example, you might assign 10.1.0.0 to VMs and 10.2.0.0 to backend servers and 10.3.0.0 to SQL Server VMs for your database. Another step is to secure the network. By default, there is no security boundary between subnets, so services in each of these subnets can talk to one another. However, you can set up network security groups which allows you to control the traffic flow to and from subnets and to and from VMs. And NSGs act as your software firewalls, applying custom rules to each inbound and outbound request at the network interface and subnet level. This allows you to fully control every network request coming in and out of the VM. The next step within the network is to plan each VM deployment. So once you have mapped out your communication and network requirements, you can start thinking about the VMs you want to create. A good plan is to select a server and take an inventory. What ports are open, what OS is used, how much disk space is in use, what kind of data does this VM use, and what sort of a CPU, memory, and disk I/O load does the server have? The next stage is naming the VM. One piece of information people often do not put much thought into is the name of the VM. The VM name is used as the computer name, which is configured as part of the operating system. You can specify a name up to 15 characters on a Windows VM and 64 characters on a Linux VM. This name also defines a manageable Azure resource and it's not trivial to change later. This means that you should choose names that are meaningful and consistent so you can easily identify what the VM does. A good conversation is to include the following information in the name. These are environment which include is this your environment for development or production or QA? Another element is location. This determines where you would like to host your VM. Third element is instance. This is for resources that have more than one named instance. For example, if it is a web server, you might name web server 01 or web server 02. Another element which you could choose is product or service. This identifies the product, application, or service that the resource supports. And the final one is role. Is it going to be an SQL server or is it going to be a web server or a messaging servers? This identifies the role of the associated resource. An Azure resource is a manageable item in Azure. Just like a physical computer in your data center, VMs have several elements that are needed to do their job. So what are these elements? The VM itself, and then you have the storage account for your disk. That's where you keep your operating system and your data. Then there is virtual network, which can be shared with other VMs or other Azure services 
or you don't have to share as well. You can isolate the boundary. Then we have the network interface to communicate on the network and you secure your environment using network security groups. And optionally, you can add a public internet access if you want direct connectivity through internet to your virtual machine as well. And Azure will create all of these resources if necessary. Or you can supply existing ones as part of your deployment process. Each resource needs a name that will be used to identify it. If Azure creates this resource, it will use the VM name to generate a resource name. If Azure creates the resource, it will use the VM name to generate a resource name. So I'm explaining all of this to make sure that the importance of having a consistency with your VM naming. All right, so another checklist for your virtual machine is deciding which location you're gonna host your VM. Azure has data centers all over the world filled with servers and disks. These data centers are grouped into geographic regions. Example, West US, North Europe, Southeast Asia, Central Australia, etc. This will provide redundancy and availability for your workloads. When you create and deploy a virtual machine, you must select a region where you want the resources, which is CPUs and storage, etc., to be allocated. This lets you place your VMs as close as possible to your users to improve performance and to meet any legal, compliance, or tax requirements. Two other things to think about regarding the location choice are first, the location can limit your available options because each region has different hardware available and some configurations are not available in all regions. Another thing to remember is there are price differences between locations. If your workload is in bound to a specific location, it can be very cost effective to check your required configuration in multiple regions to find the lowest price. Another key thing to remember in your mind is determine the size of the VM. So once you have the name and the location set, you need to decide on the size of your virtual machine. Rather than specifying a processing power, memory, and storage capacity independently, Azure provides different VM sizes that offers variations of these elements in different sizes. And Azure provides a wide range of VM size options, allowing you to select the appropriate mix of compute, memory, and storage for what you want to do. The best way to determine the appropriate VM size is to consider the type of the workload your VM need to run. Based on the workload, you are able to choose from a subset of available VM sizes. The best way to determine the appropriate VM size is to consider the type of the workload your VM need to run. And based on the workload, you would choose from the subset of available VM size options available within Azure. You have general purpose VM, which is designed to have a balanced CPU to memory ratio and ideal for testing and development for small to medium databases and low to medium traffic web servers. Then we have compute optimized VMs. These are designed to have a high CPU to memory ratio and these are suitable for medium traffic web servers, network applications, batch processes and application servers. Then we have memory optimized series. These are designed to have a high memory to CPU ratio and this is great for relational database servers, medium to large caches and in-memory analytics. The fourth type is storage optimized. These are designed to have high disk throughput and IO. This is ideal for VMs running databases. And the fifth category is GPU. GPU VMs are specialized virtual machines targeted for heavy graphics rendering and video editing. These VMs are ideal options for model training and interfering with deep learning. The sixth type is high performance computers or HCI. High performance compute is the fastest and most powerful CPU virtual machines with optional high throughput network interfaces. The last one is confidential computing. This is designed to protect the confidentiality and the integrity of data and code while it's processed in the cloud. Another question you may ask is what if 
the size of the VM needs to change. Azure allows you to change the VM size when the existing size no longer meets your needs. You can upgrade or downgrade the VMs as long as your current hardware configuration is allowed in the new size. This provides a fully agile and elastic approach to VM management. The VM size can be changed while the VM is running. As long as the new size is available in the current hardware cluster, the VM is running on. The Azure portal makes this obvious by only showing you available size choices. Changing a running VM size will automatically reboot the VM. Now let me show you how you can quickly resize an existing virtual machine. I'm on my Azure portal. Go to virtual machines. As you can see that I have a couple of virtual machines in my Azure portal. One is currently running, another one is stopped and deallocated. So I'm going to click on an existing VM. Right under settings, you can click on size. This will show you all the available size which this particular virtual machine cluster accepts. So if I decide to go with D2S, sorry, DS2V2, all I have to do is simply click on resize. That will immediately restart the machine and resize the virtual machine. That's how simple it is to resize an existing virtual machine with an Azure portal. Now let me describe about the available sizes and options for the virtual machines. You can use it to run your Linux and Windows apps and workloads. It also provides deployment considerations to be aware of when you are planning to use these resources. Under general purpose, you have different sizes ranging from B series and D series. This provides you balanced CPU to memory ratio, ideal for testing and development, small to medium databases and low to medium traffic web servers. Under compute optimized, you can see all F series VMs. Like we discussed, this is good for web traffic servers and network appliances and for batch processing and application servers. Memory optimized series include E series and M series and couple of D series VMs as well. Because this offers high memory to CPU ratio, this is great for in-memory analytics and for relational database servers. Storage optimized servers can be found under L series. Again, this is for big data, SQL, and NoSQL databases. GPU-based VMs can be found under NC, ND, and NV. And again, this is for deep learning and machine modeling interfaces. HCI or high-performance compute VMs are available under H series, which is mostly under HP, HC, and H. And confidential compute is DC SV2 series. Now let us understand the pricing model. There are two separate costs. The subscription will be charged for every VM, compute and storage. So what are compute costs? Compute expenses are priced on a per hour basis, but built on a per second basis. For example, you are only charged for 455 seconds of usage if the VM is deployed for 455 seconds and you are not charged for compute capacity if you stop and deallocate the VM since this releases the hardware. The hourly price varies based on VM size and OS you select. The cost of the VM includes the charge of the Windows operating system and for the Linux based instances are cheaper because there is no operating system license charge. Second factor for pricing is storage cost you are charged separately for the storage of the VM uses. The status of the VM has no relation to the storage charge that will be incurred. Even if the VM is stopped or deallocated and you aren't built for the running VM, you will be still charged for the storage used by the disk. And what are the payment options available? You have the pay-as-you-go model, reserved instances, spot pricing, and Azure hybrid benefit. And another consideration is before you choosing a virtual machine, you need to figure out what operating system you want to run on the virtual machine. Azure provides a variety of OS images that you can install into the virtual machine, including several versions of Windows and flavors of Linux. As I mentioned earlier, the choice of operating system will influence your hourly compute pricing as Azure bundles the cost of the operating system license into the price. And finally, 
if you can't find a suitable operating system, you can create your disk image with what you need and upload it into the Azure storage and use it to create an Azure VM. Keep in mind that Azure only supports 64-bit operating systems. Now let's discuss about the last component on the checklist is the storage for your virtual machine. All virtual machines will have at least two virtual hard disks. The first disk stores the operating system and the second is used as a temporary storage. You can add additional disk to store application data. The maximum number is determined by the VM size selection. It's common to create one or more data disk and particularly since the OS disks tend to be quite small. And also separating out the data to different VHDs allow you to manage the security, reliability and performance of the disk independently. And virtual disk can be backed by either standard or premium storage accounts. Azure Premium Storage leverages SSDs to enable high performance and low latency for VMs running intensive workloads. For running development or testing, standard storage is just fine. And when you create disk, you will have two options for managing the relationship between storage account and each VHD. You can choose either unmanaged or managed disk. And the managed disk are the newer and the recommended disk storage model. That concludes the checklist you need to keep in mind for creating a virtual machine. In the next episode, we're going to look into high availability in Azure. I will see you in the next one. Until then, take care.